Hey guys, welcome back to Star Wars Timeline. My name is Ben. Once again, I'm very pleased to introduce the Star Wars legend, a popular American artist who needs no introduction, Mr. Greg. Please remind yourself uh, uh, what you're all about to our audience, where artists can find your work, uh, what are your links, and tell us just a tiny bit about your career. We went over it in our previous interview. Just give us a brief introduction, please. Sure. Well, I'm Greg Hildebrandt. I was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1939. So I've been at it for 83 years. Uh, I'm an illustrator. I've been involved in filmmaking, uh, documentary filmmaking, and also animation, industrial filmmaking in Detroit uh, at the Jam Handy Organization, which was housed Max Flesher for 10 years. Uh, and so I had that privilege of working with animators of that nature. And then I went to do children's book illustration and, and documentary films on world hunger and illustrated uh, The Lord of the Rings in 1970s for Valentine Books, did the Star Wars poster for the first film, and uh, have done many things since then, worked for Magic, I've done cards for Harry Potter, I've done a lot of stuff for Marvel Comics. And, and if you want to look at my stuff, you can go to spiderwebart.com. And of That's course, we'll include all the links as well, make sure yeah. fans know where to find you. Guys, pretty much, if you close your eyes and think of your popular superhero, Greg has painted him. <laughs> pretty much and last time as we were speaking we had quite a different setup which was absolutely lovely and so in the moment because you were painting your piece for heavy metal magazine torna on the dragon and it was, it was a centerfold piece ah, it's a completely okay. done right uh guys yeah. once again if you're interested a little bit more in depth we speak ab about greg's early childhood and his formative years and artist you could check out that previous uh podcast but here today we would like to move forward a little bit and focus around other interesting uh, uh, topics today. Uh, could you please tell us what's the lady, latest painting you're working on right now? Uh, well, I painted a picture. Uh, a, I had a dream or nightmare in, in, in the late 60s. I was mm -hmm. going through all kinds of huge changes, mm -hmm. sociologically, politically, spiritually, religious, uh, everything. Right. Everything was shifting and, and a lot of conflict, a lot of confrontation. And I had this dream nightmare, if you will. And I, and I got up, I did sketches on it. And then after a while I painted it. Well, I always kind of like look, the painting, Jean and I then started to work together. My, my now wife, but then agent, and she still is my agent and, and, and general manager for everything. Mm -hmm. She, that, that painting appeared in an art book by uh, Valentine books on myself and my brother, the art of the brothers Hildebrand. Mm -hmm. And that, that painting, uh, was in that book and, and she and I just started to work together and I was in my studio and she was at her home and she called me and she said Black Sabbath manager called Black Sabbath the heavy metal band Black Sabbath manager called and said they wanted to use that painting this green painting uh, for their latest album Mob Rules and I said no it's too personal do not no absolutely not she said okay she hung mm. up and said yes to them which was she called me to tell me she said yes to them and I I kind of like went crazy and then I settled down I said wait a minute yeah why not this is uh you know it's just sitting and, and it'll just sit there for a long time so but my concept back then was that was just an initial more or less c comprehensive color sketch ah. in years I I planned to paint it large so wait and, by no means it was a finished product it was finished. It looked finished. Okay, okay. But I didn't. I didn't intend it to be because I. I thought I just want. I wanted to get get it out of my system. Just get mm -hmm. it down. Onto it was painted on illustration board, in in acrylic, and in wash. Used as a wash, and then. But I always had the plan to paint it larger, and I never told Jean that we've been been together for like forty years or so. Mm -hmm. Finally, I, I just mentioned it to her, a, a month or so ago, that I wanted to paint that larger. So she said, well, paint it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm painting that painting now four times up from what I originally painted it. Cause I, there, there's something about bigger, you know, when you're painting large, you feel more involved in it. It becomes more of a reality. Even as an audience, right? As a viewer, you're standing at, at the mat in front of a large, large canvas. It's a quite a different experience than standing in front of a smaller picture where you exactly. step into its world. You, you forget right. about the borders, right? So, I mean, the painting that, I, that I'm working on that now, and that's not for, you know, any intended publication or anything like that, even though it may find its way, but that is the purpose. But as far as, as actual work, mm -hmm. I'm working on a layout right now for an album cover, 
for this young woman mm -hmm. who uh, I'd done a painting of uh, Duff and Kagan of, uh, of uh, Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. He was a fan of my work and I, right. I painted a picture of his, his wife, who's a model. She's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she had ideas and she made her own costume and, and I painted her portrait. And then this, this young lady got a, 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 got a hold of us. Yeah, Jean's, Jean's telling me not to give too much detail about this, but right, right. in any event, she's a friend of the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's privacy issues involved. Right. And, but anyway, she's got a new album coming out and she's asked me to paint the cover for it. She had some ideas of what she wanted. So I'm starting to draw that layout and work that up and, and get, get her mm -hmm. approval and everything. And yeah. uh, so I'm doing that. Plus we're doing some NFTs, believe mm -hmm. it or not, for, for, with heavy metal. Because I'm very much involved with Heavy Metal Magazine right now right. in terms of uh, doing art and, and projects. We'll definitely like get to that topic as well. Uh, yeah. Just before we uh, press the record, guys, we had a very brief exchange with Mr. Greg that there's uh, one particular uh, art piece that I would like to talk about. Mr. Greg, I'm, I'm really happy that you bring this personal kind of like story into this because, you know, my father was collecting American Western and European heavy metal and rock vinyls back in Soviet Union. He's the one responsible for putting me on Black Sabbath and all of this rock and roll kind of like theme. Wow. But, you know, you start off from a place where an artist paints something that means personal to him. It's something that it's part of your inner world. But then art inevitably gets into the public eye and now everybody gets to appraise it at one point or another. And my question is, what do you feel is the illustrator's contribution to the art world and the pop culture in general? Uh, the illustrator's contribution has been immense. Illustrators have been primary in, in contributing to pop culture. Mm -hmm. they, they are the pop culturalists. I mean, it, the, going way back, I mean, going back to classic illustrations here, Landecker. Landecker was, a, a, by contrast or comparison of today, he was like literally a rock star. He would have been mm -hmm. Mick Jagger or, or, or one of the Beatles back in his day. That's how his illustrations uh, it impacted people. Mm -hmm. And so I think illustrators forever have been, you know, on the forefront. I mean, Howard Pyle, the so-called grandfather of American illustration and N.C. Mm -hmm. Wyatt, they were pop culture artists, basically, mm -hmm. you know, of their day. Yeah. And so I think it's very old, much back further than that, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we transition the conversation into obviously comic book art, you know, it is a, I, I've worked, I managed a local comic book store here in New York City in the Bronx for 13 plus years. And when you interact with so many fans and also writers, we had a couple of uh, writers who wrote for DC and Marvel living that part of the Bronx area is known for that kind of like artistic yeah. boom. And yeah. uh, there's an argument to be made that uh, comic books became the myth of modern age. It's, it's all of these Hercules and Jason and oh, the Argonauts yeah. transplanted into the modern age. And once again, guys, I've mentioned this before. Please do me a favor after you watch this podcast. Just Google Greg Hildebrandt, Brothers Hildebrandt, and Marvel, or DC, or any popular character that you might think of. They have painted, and you have painted Spider-Man, Wolverine, Captain America, Storm, Black Panther, Star Wars, you name it. The list is literally endless. Um, do you feel there is like this weight of responsibility to those particular fans who lived with these characters for most of their lives? Yeah, I, you know, there is that. I mean, uh, that's definitely there. You take into account the, the fandom, the audience right. Right. For, any, for any illustration, whether it be for comics or for, I did classic, uh, classics. Gene had a publishing company for a number of years and we, we picked the, you know, public domain classics starting with The Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. and then Dracula and the works of Edgar Allan Poe, and Pinocchio, and Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. And that approach is the same as in comics. Comics is, is more defined, though, because they're already existing as designed characters. But in the classics, whilst you think we know what they look like, there's been, with Alice in Wonderland, I don't know, 450 major artists had already painted Alice, right. you know, illustrated books, including mm -hmm. Salvador Dali. And, so the thing is, for me, with as with Marvel or, or any uh, uh, you know fantasy or literature, I think what's the audience's expectation? 
So you're always cognitive of that. Yeah, like mm -hmm. and when I illustrated the Lord of the Rings with my brother, mm -hmm. it was twofold. I mean, in terms of, or threefold, really, satisfying yourself as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, satisfying the expectation of the readership of the Lord of the Rings, and staying true as possible to the written word right. of J.R.R. Tolkien. As mm -hmm. with any illustrated book that I do, I stay true. I have to read the. I can't take Peter Pan, say, and do my own take on it, inventing mm. business. Mm. I'm sticking to the story that's there, and now I'm giving it my take in terms of the personality of the characters, their physical appearance, their costume designs, where it's not explained. But ultimately, I'm also thinking of the audience out there, kind of, in the mm. back of my head somewhere. Am I fulfilling the expectation of the audience? Right. And, you, you know, know, another part of the conversation is that, obviously, uh, when it comes to comic books, you're dealing with subject matters and heroes who are decades old, and they obviously change hands. You know, unfortunately, we're all mortal, and you know, they eventually writers and yeah. you know, artists they yeah. some retire, and others take the mantle of of portraying these characters. You know, Frank Miller's Batman is radically different from Jack Kirby's, yep. from Grant Morrison's, from Jim cool. Lee's. Um, and there's this conversation about authenticity versus creative license. My question is. Um, do you feel that artists, they should take, adhere to the original take of these characters or take creative liberties? No, I like the creative liberties aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gives freedom to, to the individual, to the artist and to the writer to, to make it, make, become part of it. Mm -hmm. if, if, if all you're doing is kind of like copying what already existed, that doesn't allow any room for you as a creative person mm -hmm. to become part of this thing that brings something potentially new to it. Uh, and I'm, oh, that's what I love about Marvel. Marvel never, there's no, nobody, we know what the costumes look like. So, uh, you know, but they don't give you a style guide to maintain an exact look of the characters. You know what I'm saying? They want the individual artist to become involved personally with it. So you have the sense and feeling that mm -hmm. you're part of this. It's yours too. You know what I'm saying? Right. You're not just copying somebody else. So DC or Marvel, they would never come to you and say, well, Mr. Greg, we want you to portray a Wolverine, but make sure he's this particular height, according to our encyclopedia, he has this no, mass of muscle, Nobody, nothing? Nobody's ever told me that. It, it's like they, they give, it, give you the project job illustration, yeah. and you take it on yourself to go and look up what you want to look at. And when I take on, and when I took on, like the, the card set there with my brother, mm -hmm. back in the 90s, uh, mm -hmm. I, there's so many artists you, you, can, you, can, you can look at. I mean, you know, you say, oh my God, I can look at Neil Adams, I can look at blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. I simply went to the source in this case, right. not to copy, but to just to kind of get clues to be inspired. You meant to the original Jack, artist, to the original writer. Jack Kirby right? and, 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 and Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they, come on, they, they're, they're, they began it. Yeah, know, the fathers. The new, Marvel, the new Marvel that we know. And that's the center, that's the beginning, that's the big bang, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> so go to that. I mean, if you're going to, and I went to that and, and just let that kind of like it, it fill me up, even though, I mean, I appreciate love. Do you suspect that some of it had to do with like Marvel coming to you and not vice versa saying, oh, okay, he's such an established illustrator. We better not tell him how to do things. Let him take a swing at it and give him interpretation because well, he has such a reputation already. I, I, well, maybe that's part of it. I mean, the thing is, uh, they, I, I think I told you this. I don't know if I mentioned this the last time we talked, mm -hmm. but I was the one that said to Gene, I want to do something in the comics. It's like mm -hmm. I'd gotten to the point that I grew up on comics. That's I mean, my generation. That's what right. we had, comic books and radio and the movies on Saturday. And uh, so I, I finally got to, you know, to the point in the early 90s sometime where I said, mm -hmm. I want to do something in the comics. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. You know, I wasn't sure. I said, if I have to go there and sweep floors, I'll sweep floors. That was my basic mentality. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I really meant that, too. I said, I'll start wherever I have to start to just to do it. Because, yeah. because I have no ex professional experience in that. I mean, I'm not known for that. Right. Because that's a highly significant, highly respected art area, even though, generally speaking, we know who always tried to put it down as, a, as, a, as, as junk. Right. We artists know how high of a level of art sequential yeah, of art is. And I think your fans, the comic book fans, also know that. And you know, sometimes the reason I ask you this question is that 
sometimes when you take creative liberties, it, it works and sometimes it misfires. Like when they were trying to reboot, relaunch the Thundercats, obviously everybody knows the popular American animated series, even though they did have Japanese anime uh, 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 animators working on the American show, in 2011, they went completely anime style. I thought it was wonderful. It lasted only one season, but for some reason, it just didn't take off. Do you feel there's a certain limit where you can push things and you just have to stop and balance it out and say, well, I can't push it too far artistically? Probably, probably there is. I mean, but I'm, I'm not opposed to pushing it. Go, if it doesn't happen, well, then that's that. Right. But no, just keep keep moving forward. I mean, again, like you, you're always trying to, stay true to the, and be integrous about it and right. stay and have and, and it comes like what kind of a fan are you as an artist i mean uh how where do you want to go what do you want to do with this to me i jump into it like i'm a kid you know you that's it. that's it for me <laughs> i just let, I, let, I let it run me i i look at it as much and look at as many artists as i can now and and just kind of like get the feeling and, and 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 put myself inside of it and just whatever comes out comes out yeah. You know, I'm not and, trying to be different. I'm not right. trying to do anything other than what I do. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. But your hand it's and your experience like also kind of, kind of sort of starts guiding you as well. Um, in 1977. What, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. To finish your other, your other question about going to Marvel and getting this job right. and, and what they, they, how they felt mm -hmm. they did. I mean, Tom DeFalco, the editor in chief, they were touring us through the whole studio at that time. Tom said, Greg, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, what are you doing here? <laughs> so there was this mentality that I was the oldest Greg Rubble. And, that, and that, that, that existed with a lot of the comic artists. Wow. Uh, they were down here. I mean, yeah. when they went to parties back in the day in the 40s and 50s, they wouldn't admit that they were comic artists because it was so demeaned. They would always say, at least you're an illustrator, even though illustrator, there's fine art, and illustration, and comics. We spoke you know? about it, right? The last this, time we spoke, at least elite and the ranks and people yeah. making divisions within the art world. Yes. Yeah. Um, in well, so they, they, had, they had that kind of, Yeah. They had that mentality to some degree. Yeah. And so they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, no, whatever. I mean, you tell me what you want. And mm -hmm. they gave, they asked for the, us to do the trading card set, you know? Yeah. And that's how that happened. Um, uh, and they I left me alone. They just let me do my thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in 1977, you painted the Tolkien calendar, right? And today, just literally yesterday, we knew that for a couple of years, Amazon is working in this humongous, humongous, the highest uh, produced uh, television ever. It's like yeah. $400 million just for season one. It's called uh, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Are you excited about it? I am. It's glad to see that the rings are still out there, yeah. you know, and that the Tolkien epic is is being reportrayed. I'm looking forward to it. Immensely. Do you yeah, personally, absolutely. as a fan, have expectations of it? Like what marks it needs to hit? I, I, I never, I never, I have high hopes. Right. You know, I, I have high hopes for it. I'm looking for it. And I don't expect anything. I just have hopes for it and hope it's fantastic. And so... I'll, once it starts and I look at it, well, then I'll, I'll respond to it. You'll go from like, there, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like uh, uh, we, Gene and I were clicking around just to sit and relax, and, and suddenly on, on one of the streams comes up Pennyworth. And I never even heard of it. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously a series, a DC series, that's been out for two, or two years or so. Right. And, there, and for some reason, I, it went over my head, Gene's head. So we said, well, yeah, let's watch it. So we started watching it. it you talk about it blew me away mm -hmm. the series i'm i'm crazy about it their take on it and it came it out of nowhere so, you had no expectations no nowhere. knowledge of it right and it just came no knowledge no expect i had no idea where they were going it's it's you know alfred as a young man in england mm -hmm. and, i mean and what they did with the storyline and the creation of these classic characters mm -hmm. to me was extremely unique and unexpected they just kept taking twists and turns with it. That's what that I personally also enjoy. I like when your expectations are subverted, but in a manner that it's not trivial. It doesn't feel like the show just wants to generate ratings, but in a way that's impactful. And it has right. within this story, you're like, oh my God, I didn't expect this to happen. Oh my God, this is a turnaround on events. I have to say goodbye to this character forever. Oh my God. But then the impact of it hits over you and like you feel so excited yeah. about it. Yeah. But if today 
the, the Tolkien estate approached you and said, Mr. Greg, we'd like you to paint a new uh, Tolkien piece. What subject matter would you choose? Well, in fact, that's actually happened. The gentleman who is uh, creating a museum uh, with Lord of the Rings illustrations and paintings. In England? I'm, I'm not sure where he is, okay. Gene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't talked to him yet. Gene's been negotiating. And in any event, he asked if I would paint a picture. And uh, I said to Gene, of course I will. I'd, I'd love to. And so, yes, I chose a scene that I want to paint. And he agreed to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to work on that also. I'm starting to rough it out, lay it all out. So, Ooh, I'm, I'm nerding out right now. I didn't even expect that answer. <laughs> and, and, he, and he wants it large. So I'm painting it four yeah. feet by eight feet. So it's going to be a, a good size painting, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, yep. you know, it's obviously Tolkien wrote his uh, novels in the 50s and the world and the culture and the public awareness was quite di different. The world was a different place than it is today. It was a very much a product of its time and it's very much a part of European history at the time that he was writing it and the kind of people that he wanted to portray. So my question is, do you feel that a classic work of fiction, a monumental work like this, should be a part of modern uh, social commentary. Uh, how, how, how do you mean that exactly? Uh, what I mean, if you take a classic piece of work like Tolkien and superimpose modern social commentary, modern social issues, modern social think, movements. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem with that, mm -hmm. personally. I think, you know, if you can use it, if it works and you're being integrous to the original storyline right. uh, and uh, what, bringing... Uh, what you believe to be or think to be Tolkien's objectives and his philosophy or spiritual views or political views right. and trying to relate that to modern times, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's all relatable to modern times, for God's sakes, the, the, the insanity of hate, the, the madness of that, that's in the world in this country right now right. of hatred and conflict and confrontation. And that's what Tolkien talks about, right? The spirituality, the divided peoples, the, we have the dwarves over here and, uh, you know, halflings over there and humans and all quarreling. But that's the whole story of it, right? Yeah, and, and, and orcs, you know what I mean? I'm not, you know, I have a high school education, so, you know, I keep finding things out. And I didn't know what the word orc, O-R-C, mm -hmm. was when I illustrated the rings. I created these guys who were very armored and non, not, not really, they're humanoid, but they were definitely reptilian. Mm. Reptilian. Right. And, 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 you know, I'm not saying that's good, bad, or different. The thing is, when you go back and you took a look at the word orc now, and you see that, that Blake, William Blake looked at that as the, as the, as the, as the brute. It's, it's the brutish yeah. hate lack of love aspect of human nature mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah so i think if i would have known the meaning of that word according to yeah. the gnostic thinking of william blake yeah i would have probably applied that kind of like physical look to the beings that's very very interesting and i think you've important some uh, pointed out something very important mr greg we we constantly come back to our favorite stories, to our favorite characters, and there's an opportunity to once again re-examine and learn and say, wow. And it, your perspective shifts, and no matter how old you are, you know, I'm 40, yeah. you're, you're just a little bit older than I am, and, <laughs> and, and you, you, you have an opportunity to learn, you have an opportunity to inform yourself and just move forward. And you're absolutely right, you know, if you're creating something, even a clo uh, classic work of fiction, it needs to speak to audience today, you yeah. know, not to the audience of the 50s and 60s, today. Right. Totally. totally. Um, well, I'm for that a, a million percent, yeah. you know. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And, and, and honestly, it's not that I didn't expect it in a different answer. I just wanted to us to have that little, you know, kind of conversation on the footsteps of this uh, show, which is about to well, come. Can I just stick this in? That's painting the, the so called Mob Rules album cover, which is called, for me, it's called The Crucifiers. I've got, I've got all kinds of, I don't have any one pat name for it, you know. They, 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 they're, they're, they're we were talking here with, with a friend, Keith, who's a friend and works right. with Gina as an artist. And, and his thought, and we were discussing, it, you know, these beings that are in the picture are, are faceless, black hole mm -hmm. covered with skins. And mm -hmm. they're basically cloaked 
they're cloaked in in the skins of their victims in the mm. flesh of their victims that's who they are right. and with that knowledge that i have of that dream and what it meant to me then i'm bringing to it what will enter the, this version of it that i'm painting right is the present day horror mm -hmm. the present day conflict and hate. you're modernizing it for today's audience yeah it's, it's, there will be elements in here that will be all even though that kind of hate and, and, and intolerance and bigotry mm -hmm. it, it goes way back to cain and abel yeah yeah it's absolutely always been, true mm -hmm. it's always been here yeah. in, in all kinds of levels as you well know you know mm -hmm. and and it's still here and i i wanted to have a universal feeling that it goes back in time and in the present and hopefully not too far into the future mm -hmm. and, anyway, and anyway i'm bringing in contemporary into this right into that's that's history. really really awesome that's really really exciting uh by the way speaking of mob rules and uh black sabbath Mob Rules is my favorite uh, Black Sabbath album because as Ronnie James Dio, I saw him yeah. twice in New York City with my brother. Yeah. He was still yeah. still around all day. Yeah. <laughs> Mob Rules, like, huh? and you know he created that sign. He's like on stage, such a lovable and energetic yeah. well, man. Everybody does this. What right, about right. this? Yeah, yeah, a, a true artist in the full sense yeah. of the word, and and I think yeah. your artwork only amplified their their. Yeah. And he was such a huge Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy nut. It, it was it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and Mr. Greg, I would like to shift gears a little bit here and get into a, a little bit more specific topic of uh, character design and preparation for a new project. What makes a timeless character? Oh, God. <laughs> no, it's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I don't. Let me simplify. How, how much of a character's uh, uh, story versus visual presentation makes that impact well i think the story's got to be there you've got to when you're creating any kind of character mm -hmm. it, it, you're going into his her, her whole being right what who and what and the politics their thoughts their feelings or how they were raised mm -hmm. uh, i think the more human the character in terms of human emotions that all of us experience mm -hmm. the more long, long lasting it'll be you know if it's, uh. if it's tied into who and what we are as, as you know so in other words a human quality that we can identify with yeah and i i you know for me a successful film or a story of any kind is if i shed a tear that, that's a success somebody mm. can bring a tear to your eye over a situation that's like hitting the bell and bam going through the, you know i just recently saw something like i i hardly ever respond to uh, entertainment like that i hardly ever cry but i wasn't on the verge of uh, as that's, a show that I just watched that's, that's amazing when, when that happens it makes you it or makes like you compassionate power. it makes you feel for the character right yeah. yeah but how much of it is also the visual representation well yeah that's always the you're, you're trying to bring out by physical appearance what the person the character is like it's like trying to illustrate the seven deadly sins mm -hmm. using figures using you know humanoid figures of which uh who the hell was it it was a Paul cadmus you know that mm -hmm. name at all no he did the seven deadly sins i got the book they're they're mm -hmm. incredible and you know i've thought about illustrating that subject too for the tarot cards right. you know also this is a mythical subject and getting into bringing into it what i feel or think what that's really saying to me mm -hmm. along with the history of it, you know what it what it's supposed to mean and what people think right. it means you know? uh mr guy uh, I, I do apologize do you mind if i bring you just a little bit closer to the speaker well, to the, where the microphone yeah. is so we could hear it just a little right. bit more. no no it's yeah. fine. thank you so much um but i think yeah the physical appearance is critical so it's it's both you, you you're saying it's yeah. it's the the word and the picture yeah absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely you know when yeah. i used to work at the comic book store and you have returning what would you call a regular customer is coming every week there you have their stack of comic books in the folder you know the these people yeah. by name and there's always a question, you know, when you ask a, a fan and for somebody it's, they react to picture first and then it's story second. But other people say, well, no, 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 hold on a second. It's yeah, like Wolverine looks cool. Uh, your Hulk is, is interesting, but it's really the story that I'm digging. And they start reciting what happened to this character in the previous picture. What do you, yeah. what do you think comes first to a character's success is it the story aspect of it or is it the comic book cover because obviously people when they go shopping for comic books the first thing they see is the cover i think it's the picture 
I, I think it's the visual image. I mean, that it, it, if you don't know the story, if you don't know the character, it's mm-hmm. going to pick the picture that's going to hit you. And then right. when you start to read it, well, now that becomes a whole other thing. Oh my God, there's something to this. Thing. Yeah. There's, it's not just a great picture or pretty picture, however, there's all oh, there's depth in, in, in thought and in, in, in feelings and there's emotions. And yeah, mm-hmm. but if you don't know, you start to read, that's when you find out. Now they both become significant. But I mean, that initial grab to somebody has to be a picture. Well, it's always the the image. It's the, it's the picture. You know, it's like that when I was doing a lot of book covers for Valentine along with him. That was it. They had a whole system of the, 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 the cover sells the book. That was mm-hmm. that was a simple directive. This mm-hmm. cover is going to sell the book. Right. Obviously, unless the a person going and knows the particular author and they don't care what the cover is, they're buying that author. But if it's just somebody perusing the bookshelves, yeah. the picture's going to be the main thing that's going to hit them. And, and a lot of the time, mm-hmm. a scene would be invented that really wasn't even in the book. Right. You know? And that's honestly, it relates to my previous question, you know, how do the illustrators specifically affect our modern culture? Is that if the book gives you this powerful story and the powerful character, you as an illustrator, you open the window for us, you invite us to that story. And especially it's again, when we speak about the comic books, I would, I would, each week, I would put these 20 plus comic books on the shelf there on the front line and some would be picked up and some would stay there until two three weeks or never get sold and then shoveled yep. in the boxes because that first picture is the window into the story and the yep. customers coming in is like hey ben what's this new character for the image i never recognized this character before is it like a new thing let me check it out but then next week they might come in and they toss the book on the on the cabinet and say this story sucks i want my money back or like oh my god it was so amazing where's part two when it's coming out no the story better be there you can't you can't just deceive people with a beautiful cover and have the book, the interior be nothing. I remember mm-hmm. the stuff I used to read and talk to Disney animators mm-hmm. at the old days in the Disney studio when Walt was still alive. Over every door was written the stories, the thing. Over every door, right? Yeah, so that you the artists wouldn't get lost in in their own personal shtick, but just remember to keep your keep your eye on the horizon. You know, yeah. keep your eye on the target. And that's true for any illustrator. Mm-hmm. When you're like I'm illustrating, you know, Peter Pan. I've got to keep my eye on the target, on the essence of the story, and mm-hmm. what you know Barry wants, what, what he wanted with this thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know, when when I Google uh, Greg Hildebrand, brothers Hildebrand, and I look at these characters like Spider-Man, you know, versus Wolverine. Obviously, one is a young man who is very life and his acrobatic figure. He's like a teenager. He also has a very sharp tongue kind of character versus Wolverine, who is like this a bundle of muscle. He has like a, a cigar and he's a like, hey, bub. And he's like very cowboy, almost kind of like persona. He's very savage. How do you prepare in order to start painting these different sorts of characters? Like, is there some kind of acrobat or gestural drawings that you uh, start doing as a, as a study? Or is it like... Uh, take photographic references. How do you prepare in order to paint these popular characters? I start with sketch, uh, fast thumbnail sketches with no photography, basically looking at the character. I know the character I'm going to draw, say if it's Wolverine, mm-hmm. and, and I'm drawing a particular scene, you know, for uh, a book, for a cover or whatever. I know what, I, I've already determined what the scene's going to be, Okay. you know, what, what, what I want it to be. And so therefore, now I, I basically, you know, and I, comp- I come up with a first of composition. That's composition is primal. Right. You know, where, 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 where's the positioning of all the key elements in the picture? Where's the primary center of interest? Second, I go through all that. Mm-hmm. There's where he's located. This is, this is the, the punch right here. This is what, this is where. The- and do you do quick yeah. sketches? Yeah. Quick okay. doodle, little doodle. Almost okay. that they're not not about good drawing at all. It's mm-hmm. no, not, not much more than a stick figure. Mm-hmm. But that, all it's about is positioning the elements. Mm-hmm. Key elements versus Wolverine, say, mm-hmm. and attitude. You know, position and attitude and what's happening with the scene, which determines the attitude, what's going on. So you're, you're understanding all that and doing what to do. Real fast sketches. Sometimes I'll do 50, 60 of them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that many. Mm-hmm. I, I just not because any one of them is wrong or not right because i don't even know what's wrong or right is. You know, i'm having fun with it i just want to explore the subject 
just, you, just you're almost like a sculptor who's trying to find the right pose, right? Yeah, exactly. The image is there in the marble, like Michelangelo said, right? I just got to reveal it. And it yeah. kind of like there's that feeling about, about doing illustrations too. And so you find it and you get that pose and right attitude. Then I get a mop. First, you no, know, that rough sketch, and I'll tighten it all up now. Show that to marble. They say yes. Primarily, they say yes, and maybe some minor suggestion. Mm -hmm. Then I get a model. Yeah, it's, it's something that I remember as a as a trained animator, which you know I have a BA at uh, traditional animation. I loved I loved my classes of the sketch drawing and 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 uh, gestural drawings and stuff like this. Yeah, but this is now we we talked about a little the established characters, the stuff that you came into and you know you painted. Now I want to talk about your original stuff because the last painting that we were talking about the opponent of the dragon lady you said it was like your own invention version of like of of your own lord of the rings sort of type of villain how yeah. do you design your own characters uh well in this case is that that's gotta look lord of the ringsy mm -hmm. you know what i mean the character has to be i want him to be you know so you can't see his face he's dealt helmeted in dark dark armor and so, you know, I, I kind of understand what's going on with the character from all my knowledge about the Lord of the Rings and more or less very medieval esque, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, so I just start doodling. It's like I, I, a lot of stuff happens. You intellectually, your thought process leads you to a certain point. And all you're doing there is just, as it were, seeing through a glass darkly. Mm -hmm. You kind of like know what you're going towards, but until I put that pencil on the piece of paper and start to make moves and marks, that's when it starts to grow. And I sometimes see. it'll just take its own life. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. just like a writer, you know, you start to write the characters telling you where to go. And they tell you to write it over and over again and throw it away and throw it until yeah. you know who this character is. Yeah, and that character finally is talking to you. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you're not talking to the See, you're, you're speaking as, as an author to me right now. I feel like I'm talking to an artist and an uh, author at the same time because I guess it's a, it's a very similar kind of process, right? Same thing. You're inventing. There's a white. There's a white piece of paper in front of you. You have got to fill this thing up with with this story that you're in, and mood and atmosphere and character that you try to create. Eventually, you get it and it starts to tell you what to be. Yeah. And you know, they are, when I, I have a couple of like how to uh, uh, write books, you know, like of, with musings of someday maybe touching the craft and like if I'm not intimidated to just write my own story. But they it's always say. It's hard, right? And the, the writers say that no, you, you need to know everything about your character before you start on your story. You need to know what your desires, what their desires are. And we spoke about the last time, you know, I, I completely marvel over your art. You know, I'm a huge, huge fan. When I look at your paintings, there is a story on the canvas. It's not merely a picture. There is a background story to this character. Do you know everything about your original characters that you designed before you start drawing them? Do you have like mental uh, I sketches? Know, I know a lot, but mm. I don't know everything because in the drawing, they start to become more and more alive and mm. their personalities emerge, you know, their, 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 their way of speaking and, and their attitudes and, and what they can do and can't do. And that, in, in fact, I mean, one of the stories that I wrote with my son, right. The Emerald Seven, which appeared in the Frank Rosetta Fantasy Illustrated magazine. For, mm -hmm. for the brief stay of that magazine, it only lasted for several issues. We had a, we were, we were on a path to creating a whole, you know, ongoing story. And we, my son jumped, started off. I had some, designed some characters. Mm -hmm. And Tim, with Tim, he, he did some work. And uh, there were pirate types, fantasy pirates. Fantasy pirates, okay. Mm -hmm. Fantasy pirate chick to, to start off with. Mm -hmm. And then I started drawing other times, you know, all these kinds and types and, and they were all sort of like from different worlds so they weren't all just you know humans they were all different kinds of beings mm -hmm. and as i drew them they started to develop a character my son starts to write about them him and i started to draw more pictures and designing their ships and what their ship what happened oh these they're they're kind of like these kinds we're inventing it as we go in fact we're inventing it as we go and doing the finished full segment of the story and it's appearing in the magazine and we're still inventing it as we go, and then it appears in the second issue, and we're still inventing. So it never it. the process never stops, right? It never stops, and you're you're, you're running into plot situations. Of, you, you you painted yourself into a corner, 
how the hell are you going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And the inventiveness then that has to take place. My son was fantastic at it, of inventing business, how to get out of that corner. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And that was exciting as hell. Awesome. Because it's not just here in your room. This is in print. And you've got to get this thing ready for the, you know? <laughs> You know, but it's funny how I see uh, the same level of, of excitement from you because when you talk about Lord of the Rings and talking, which guys, we spoke about our previous podcast, I'll definitely drop the link here so you could check it out. But you share the same amount of excitement for the story that you didn't invent, but you're still living in there as a fan. And also when you create your own stories, you're equally excited because now you are the captain of the ship. You're charting yeah. the destiny for these characters. Yeah, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate thrill, if it were, if you mm -hmm. want to put it that way. That's the ultimate challenge to be original. I mean, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the ultimate uh, kick, you know, that's, that's it. I mean, it's all yours. It's your baby. You're yeah. creating your own kid here. And I, I've been doing that. And I've got all kinds of stories that i got going. i got another great one going with my son, Nikola Tesla. Yeah. And, you know, we hope to take that somewhere. You know, it's, a, it's an alternate story. It's not the old, you know, Edison versus Peck. Tesla. Right. We've created him. It's like Bram Stoker's Dracula, right? He takes a historical yeah. uh, character and then puts a twist on it. Right. It, it's a pretty big twist. Mm -hmm. And so it's fun. And you just kind of like, you, you it, the thrill of inventing these characters and circumstances as you go is like, you know, you're living a whole separate life in a way yeah. of excitement by doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like you're, you're a whole, in this whole other world. Of, uh, who of, said it? I forgot the quote exactly. I, I don't remember the origin of this quote, but they were saying, those who read books live, uh, live many lives. Those who don't read literature live only one life. There you go. Right? <laughs> um, and those who create stuff like the literature. Exactly. And illustration. You create the worlds for us, for friends to like just jump into and completely be absorbed by them. Uh, Mr. Greg, yes. there's one piece I'd love to talk about. Um, I told you that uh, the way that I discovered your art when I started Googling, because I didn't have just access to, to your art before. And I started looking at all these cards, Dash Randar, Star Wars, and an original Star Wars painting. Just yesterday or before yesterday, a couple of days ago, I click on my Twitter because, you know, I see you always on my feed and I see the Angel of the Gods. It's the yeah. licensed heavy metal uh, piece that you, I think you painted in 1981. It was released in 1982. Uh, and now we're celebrating the 40th anniversary uh, of this piece, and, and it's going to be featured in a cover of the Heavy Metal magazine for February 22nd. First of all, congratulations. Your, your piece is as old as I am. <laughs> and to 40 wow. more years, sir, it's, it's just, it's phenomenal. It's inconceivable for me. And I, I have to be honest with you. It, I'm not trying to sugarcoat it or just, just sound extravagant to spice up this, you know, uh, um, live stream or podcast, I was blown away. I was yeah. completely stunned by that piece. Uh, if you don't mind, with your permission, what I'd like to do is, um, I want to segue into the artist's creative voice. But before we get to that, and I ask my questions about this piece, if you don't mind, just my own very tiny, very abbreviated interpretation of that piece, and we'll take it from there. I, well, that I will, I mean, I'll, yeah, like I'll give you my interpretation okay. of oh, the story, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we'll Great. take it from there. I want to ask you a like couple of questions. Like um, obviously, the podcast is about you. It's not about me. <laughs> I just wanted oh, to kind of like nerd out about the story. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at this piece. I'm like, I, 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 from that day forward, like every hour I come back to it, I look at this painting again. And I see this, this supernatural presence, you know, and, and with the, all the drama in the background with the opening sky and the gates of heaven are open. And there's these two opposite creative forces at play. There's this male sexual symbology, obviously this noble beast, right? This unicorn, and he's whipping his tail very playfully. It's obviously a sexual connotation, you know, historically throughout folklore and culture, the unicorn you know, with a male kind of like genitalia, and he's very playful with his horn. And he's, he's stricken with this young lady who at first to me seemed like a young lady, like the innocent youth of it. But then I kind of started examining the painting further. And she's the Mother Earth because she's laying on this grass and this vegetation is growing. And she's this flowering maiden because obviously flower, once again, a very sexual kind of a, a, a component of the here. painting, right? And I honestly concluded that what I saw in one painting was the Genesis story. 
you told the story of creation in one painting and i keep coming back and back and back to it and i know i need to have it on my wall it's it's just completely engrossed me and uh, thank you so much for this painting and i just wanted to ask a couple of questions there first of all did i get any of the story of your intent right love that i think that's fantastic man that's all yeah i'd say that's there gina and i both came up with that image but thank uh -huh. you right you're right on you're right on what inspired it oh my god that's it's been 40 years it's a long time i yeah. know i'm sorry yeah. if i put you in the spot well, well i think i think uh maybe jane had just started the name of her company mm -hmm. she called it unicorn publishing uh -huh. so instantly didn't we jane have a talk about i'm gonna call for jane's input the angel of the gods painting you and i discussed that first of all mm -hmm. I said I wanted to paint a unicorn. As simple as that. Yeah. And because I had never painted one. Okay. And and she Jean said you'll paint a girl with her, a nude. Mm. So Jean entered that. And I said, fantastic. So it's a collaborative process. A husband yeah. and wife, a well, male and a female, the two components. Yes. Well, we weren't married yet. We were, oh, okay, we, were okay. we were married to separate people. We, okay. we, you know, so we were not, you know, we were on a wavelength so creatively, incredibly so. And so Jean suggested that she's the one that suggested the calla lily all in the foreground, which were very erotic indeed. And I then start to draw an image that's, how can I put it, more graphic than this one. Mm. Without getting too descriptive, right? It, 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 now, the issue was this though: what we were designing this for was for a poster for Verkirka Publishing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. No. They were one of the biggest. Uh, were were one of the biggest poster publishers in the world, mm. and they were in Holland, located in Holland, and. Uh, we had done some work, two pictures for them that they wanted. They suggested they wanted these, these particular kinds of images, hidden image puzzles for a puzzle. And Gene suggested to them that that paper was not going to sell. And right. they didn't sell. It didn't work. Mm. And, and this was, see, it was all very business oriented also. You get me? How the right, of course. Yeah, yeah. How stuff happens. That happens. She said, well, we've got to come up with an image that will make the money back that they lost you know i get and, it and, and come up with something that's bound to really hit well even though you never know what's going to hit really yeah and it's not our responsibility but we chose to do it you know and we mm -hmm. just wanted to do it and so that's the, it i i finally did the layout of that whole setup with the glorious sky opening up and i wanted to have that just what you're just talking about uh, mythological, mystical, supernatural quality about it in mm -hmm. terms of the, the uh, yin and yang. The, you know, uh, when I look at the piece, it's it's a, such a beautiful uh, synergy between the innocent and playful. And because, you know, as I read on the website a little bit, that, that kind of that painting set you on your course later on in the 90s to get seriously involved and interested in the pinup art. And yeah. that's what the whole of well, talk about the pinup art what's what's the well, yeah, well, mm -hmm. okay let's well, go back to that that image right it was the combination of the innocence and the, the erotic and the playful yeah right the erotic yeah that that people uh, heavy metal did a book like 20 years of heavy metal cover i've mm -hmm. got it you know they did this some years ago and that cover was the biggest seller in their history up to that point that cover because it contained those elements in other words it was not so explicit so as to make it really graphically uh x-rated right you know it was it's subtle it almost on a level of innocent fantasy kind of it can be seen in that way so it had that double barrel of impact on people mm. and that's what made it they assume was so successful you see yeah i love it, i love how her, her breasts are she's just a beautiful everybody 
appreciates and instinctively loves, you know, the beautiful, the life that you know, there's this perf perfect form and how her breasts are covered by this beautiful flowing hair. And I don't know why I just look at it. It nothing about this. There is not an ounce of like vulgarity or explicitness like, hey, come look at this. Appreciate the body, not the soul. You're looking yeah. at something that has a very spiritual foundation to it. Yeah, absolutely. So I totally uh, that I'm great. I'm so happy that you see it that way. Do you feel that there do you feel that there is an appeal when I, I started art school here and I started learning about more about our diff different artistic movements and I stumbled across the pinup art and how much of a impact it had on American illustration. Do you feel that's also a component, a crucial piece to pin up art's success? That perfect balance between the innocent and provocative, the erotic totally. and, and, you know, the chastise. Totally, because totally, we're not doing pornography. Right. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not being negative about pornography. It's right. as good art form as any art form is. Right. It's ancient. Right. And, but I mean, I choose not to do it. You know, mm -hmm. and that's not something that the uh, direction that I go in. So no, th these are yeah built based based on the more classic approach to like Gil Eldrin and Zoe Moser, one of the what few females that were involved in, in pinup art. Mm -hmm. What a Alberto Vargas, I think I've mentioned uh, the last time we spoke that he was the one that kind of opened my eyes to it. I saw his work yeah. and I was just stunned. Wow. So th the stuff is like they're they're painting classically, in a way, you know, in, in, in a modern classic sense, mm -hmm. you know. And that's and I always love the satirical aspect of pinup art. Yeah, like I mean, the ladies are always the American ladies inviting their boomer generation husbands coming off war. Right? Like, hey, you want to start a family? <laughs> yeah, there's the satirical aspect of the stuff that really I enjoy. Right. I always enjoyed it with, with the, the masters, you know, like Gil Eldrin. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely satire is involved, comedy and humor is involved, in it, along with beauty and mm -hmm. storytelling. I like I like story. My approach to it is to hopefully tell a little story with each painting, not just you know. I love the the, the paintings of, of women just like it's a, a white plain back thing, right. you know, like Margaret primarily did. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. But I love the storytelling. I always gravitated towards more story driven art because I guess that's my personal bias, my interest in it. If if I'm if I'm there staring at it for minutes and hours and I'm trying to deduce and figure out what is happening, you have my attention. If it's just yeah. a beautiful form, like for example, not to take anything away from Boris Vallejo, I think he's one of the greats out there. But to him, his imageries are very straightforward and there is no mystery behind the image. It's a beautiful male form, very sexual, very strong, very alpha, and very strong and powerful females. And that's, that's all there is to it. Yeah, that's what he chooses to do. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's his choice. That's his creative choice. It's not to yeah. be scrutinized or put under anyone else. Right. It's just no, different. No, 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 no. That's, mm -hmm. that's a different separate category. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Greg, uh, I wanted to move on to the last segment of this podcast. We were uh, briefly uh, mentioned artist creative voice. Uh, what I want to say here is that, you know, you portray established heroes that have a rich legacy. They had a slew of different artists and, and writers that worked on them. And yet, at the same time, your fans keep coming back to your versions of those characters, to your versions of Spider-Man, your versions of uh, Batman, your versions of Superman, um, time and time again. And what do you think makes an artist's work unique? and stand out from the rest of the competition? Oh, wow, that's a heavy question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, hey, look at I mean, I go back to the base. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get just pragmatic. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get too philosophical about it. Okay. I'm going to say the way I approach any painting I do, aside from content, you know, whatever that may be, personal right. or, you know, or, or commission work, my, my basic what is a judgmental uh sequence is number one composition mm -hmm. how powerful direct readable clear dramatic emotional is the composition that is the setup that is the yeah. positioning of all the elements in the picture plane. that's very pragmatic how do you position all that to get mm -hmm. the biggest impact the second is in line of importance, as far as I'm concerned, is drawing. How well drawn is it? How yeah. well drawn? Not, not that it has to be realistic, but 
how well drawn is it? That's number two. The third, in my particular case, because I deal with form, is lighting. What's the lighting? How dramatic is the lighting? Is the lighting part of the story? Is it conveying the mood, the atmosphere, the story that you're trying to tell? Where are you positioning your lights? And fourthly, what color? What color are those lights? And how does that and how do those colored lights impact every object in your scene? Mm -hmm. That's the sequence of events that I go through. I think if I were so to say it comes out at the end of that, yeah. That's what I end up with. I think if I were to say that, you know, how each each uh, creative person has their own unique voice, their vision. If I were personally as a fan to describe your unique voice, it's the first thing that I reacted to on a, instinctually was the colors. And the colors are the color palette is so rich and contrasting. It's like it's very celebratory of life. You celebrate yeah. heroism. You celebrate that that vitality of like I'm gonna go and do the good thing. I'm Batman. I'm gonna don this mask and I'm gonna go and save the you know the good guys from the bad. Well, guys. When it, certainly when it comes to the comic stuff, that's where when I took that arm with Tim back in the '90s, I said, my God, this is a great opportunity to go crazy with color. This is, after all, the four color pop culture medium. Right. You know, we're talking the original printing, the primary colors. Look at Superman. He's the primary color red, yellow, and blue. Primary colors. You know, and that's, that's, this, that's this imagery. It's that primary, gutsy, mm -hmm. and powerful, and strong, and in your face. It's very and much you. Marvel is you, in a way. You channel that, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, totally. Completely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you yeah. know, when I was going in sc uh, to school and they're teaching you this, that stuff, you know, the formal academia that you, the artist tool, you, you need to know the artist tool, the anatomical proportion, the perspective, color three, blah, 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 all of that stuff. My question is, in your effort to, or do you consciously think about separating your Spider-Man from another artist Spider-Man by manipulating that artist's toolkit, by playing around with perspective or stretching the form or doing anything with it to stand out? No, I'm just trying to draw Spider-Man the way I see Spider-Man. Mm. I mean, I, I don't try to, I don't look at I, other artists other than to be inspired, not to copy, right. not to be formed, not, not to try to be different than. So there's no magic trick to it? No, there is no magic trick. I just, I try to draw a picture of Spider-Man the way I see Spider-Man. And I'm the first one, remember, I don't know if we talked about this, to raise his webbing on a painting. Well, uh, you the, the, the first one? I was a very, yes, he, uh, Bob Ross gives me credit of that in his book that he did. He really? He credits us for raising Spider-Man's spider web. If you go to one of the, some of those early images we did yeah. in the 90s, because I'm, I'm painting Spider-Man, right? His toes, you right. know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm starting to paint the, the, the webbing on his costume, and I'm just starting to paint black lines. And I'm thinking, they're not black. That's that's webbing. Mm. The webbing should be the color of this, the webbing that shoots out of his hands because that's ah. the kind of because it's not just they're black lines in right. the comic because we're dealing with ink and we're dealing with an ink drawing, and you can't make them look rendered. You can't possibly do that with long shutters. You just got to draw lines. So I said that the pragmatic, logical thinking about that was, well, I'll raise them a little bit as though they're, mm. you know, 3D. And That's I, what Sam Raimi ended up using in the, his first original Spider-Man movie, right? That well, they, kind of they, custom. Yes, yes, exactly. They, they told us. I came from you. Yep. <laughs> wow, this is awesome. Like one singular contribution to the, that to is the awesome. uh, history of Spider-Man is I raised the webbing on his costume. And guys, let's not forget that Mr. Greg, uh, on par with being the artist, he was also a comic book fan. You mentioned in this podcast, in the yeah. previous podcast, we talked about how your child was surrounded by comic books. Oh. Did you ever see yourself in one of these heroes or fantasize like, ooh, I want to be like, you know, Bruce Wayne with that huge mansion and who I can operate, has all these gadgets and computers and can do good <laughs> out of his hub place. Did you ever see yourself in any of these heroes? Oh, God, yes. All the time. Tim and I would both make, we make costumes of all the, of, of Superman and Batman, constantly we would we would scrounge cloth and we would cobble these things together, put them on underneath of our clothes. <laughs> Superman and walk down the street to the neighborhood, kids and pull the show the S, and we would 
we would get up to the attic in our family's house where we grew yeah. up in the east side of Detroit. It was only a one-story house, thank God, because we'd get through the attic onto the roof without our mother knowing it, you know, take off our little clothes. And there's a Superman costume. We'd jump off the roof, see if we could fly. I, I, I mean, it was always that way, absolutely. For I mean, Halloween as well? Did you guys dress up for Halloween? Oh, God. We would spend six, eight, ten months on a costume for Halloween. Wow. We would be fanatic about it. I mean, costumes galore. The cosplay today, I totally relate to these people. Yeah, cosplay is a, a well of imagination. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's like a whole world of its own, right? It's a world of its own. People exhibiting their, their creativity. And some of them are fantastic. I mean, they're just like professional. I mean, you know, on that level of a movie. But just, and I'm, I'm totally related to it because I mean, you know, I did this all my life. And I still do it when I need to do illustrations, you know? You know what and cracks it, me up? Um, when they do gender swap heroes, they do it in Star Wars all the time and it drives some jaded fans up the walls. I love it. They would have a couple of a beautiful, uh, like a, a couple. You could start say it's a boyfriend and a girlfriend and the boyfriend would dress as a lady and has like this chiseled muscle body, like ah, flexing <laughs> muscles. And the lady's dressed up as Han Solo and they're like together and people would just go up the wall. And I love that. I love that riot of creativity and just swimming oh, against yeah. the current. It's incredible. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's, 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 imagination is everything, for God's sakes. There's mm -hmm. nothing without it. You know? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Greg, before we wrap up, uh, once again, thank you so much. I absolutely yep. adore talking to you. Thank you for giving me your, your hour of your time. It's, it's, I feel privileged to be able to talk about the painter behind that. Well, it's fun talking painting. with you. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I enjoy Thank it you. very much. And my final question is, what would be your advice to young artists in art schools who dream of becoming comic book artists? Oh, uh, my God, just to never stop doing it. And, and you know, draw, it's got to run you. First. I mean, I hope it runs you. You don't run it. It's got to obsess you to the point where it's the singular thing of your existence, basically. Yeah. And that's that's and, and never stop. And don't ever listen to anybody that tells you you can't do it. Number one, don't ever listen to anybody that says no. And always and be inspired by others. Work. Don't don't try to compete with them. Mm -hmm. I'm totally against competition in art completely. That's for other realms and genres. Co compete with yourself. You know, constantly challenge yourself to get better and better and better. Be inspired by other people's work. Don't be. Don't try to copy it, be inspired by it, it, it you know, it, it, and just let it turn you on. And, 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 and that's the main motivation you should have. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's the way. I think it's I super helpful. I think people, young people, because me going through my college experience too, and not being sure of myself and still finding my footing in the art world as a 40 year old, I think it's immensely valuable for young people to hear it from a legend like you tell them that it, follow it, your it heart stops. you know it never stops every time i start a new piece it's, it's challenging i mean I'm, I, you know there's that fear of failure that's there you know will i be able to is it that that, that never leaves you that's just all part but that's all part of the process so i mean you as young being insecure or not being that certain just remember that that gets better and better and better you become more you become more certain and you gather information and knowledge but you still are always approaching the thing with humility mm -hmm. and with with great expectation and uncertainty. But that's the thrill of it, you know, to see if you can finally get your way through that and get to the, the other end of it and end up with something. Don't be afraid know? of a challenge, right? That's right. Mr. Greg, once again, thank you so much for, for being here with us. I hope we get to do this again. This is our very first podcast of this year. Uh, congratulations on the 40th anniversary. Uh, uh, once we click off here, I'd like to talk to you about how I can acquire a larger version size piece of that poster. But guys, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. I absolutely urge you to check out Mr. Greg's links. I'll drop them all in this video section below. Check out his art. He is a true legend, a monumental contribution to Star Wars fans, to comic book fans, to popular uh, culture in general. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, guys, please consider subscribing, hit all the links, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.